Well, you think people were reconnecting? Steve. Hello. Hello, this is Rick Roman here at EEAP with... Michael Crawley. We're going to try this again, it looks like. We are going to be discussing today machine guarding for California businesses. Hopefully our uh, presentation is coming through and you're getting audio this time. Yes, I hope the audio comes through. That was a little weird, wasn't it, Rick? Yes, it was. So here we go. We're going to be talking about the basics of machine guarding today. And a couple of topics we'll be going over are different methods of guarding. We'll also be talking about the manufacturer's specs versus Cal OSHA specs. Um, and also some of the common violations that we see out there in the field. So Rick, what picture are we looking at in that photo there? What is that? Well, you've got a, a picture of a guy who's apparently suffered from a severe injury from probably something like a table saw. And uh, you're looking at some guards that can be purchased for various machines. And uh, there's a, a piece of equipment that's guarded. And then there's also uh, an example of, uh, of guarding that's done where uh, by simply passing your hand through there, it'll turn your machines off. Jeez but, Louise, that is ridiculous. And we have gotten the thumbs up, Rick. People can actually hear us now. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and uh, move forward. So as we talk about the basics of machine guarding here, we're going to go over a few of the different codes uh, that Cal OSHA has specifically for this. And uh, so the first one is regarding moving parts of machinery or equipment. And the code is, it says, all machines, parts of machines, or component parts of machines, which create hazardous, revolving, reciprocating, running, shearing, punching, pressing, squeezing, drawing, cutting, rolling, Rolling, mixing, or similar action, including pinch points and shear points not guarded by the frame of the machine or by location, shall be guarded. Yes, an attorney wrote that. I'm sure you can sense that about that code. That code really just says if you don't have a machine guarded, you, you, you're you going to have problems with Cal OSHA. And as we go through this, we're going to find out a little bit more about how detailed this can get. Okay. So in this, in this code here, it talks about all moving parts of belt and pulley drives located seven feet or less above the floor or working level shall be guarded. So as you're looking out there in your shops, your machine shops, your anything really that's got a belt or pulley, you can see we've got some uh, a, a drill press here, uh, the top of a drill press possibly, and, uh, and a couple other things. You got to have these guarded. You got to enclose them in some fashion so that you cannot put your fingers in there. A lot of times your maintenance guys are going to tell me, but I need to get in there to change the belt. And so you can do a number of different things. In the bottom three pictures, you can see in the far left picture, we have put a bunch of expanded metal. I love expanded metal when it comes to guarding. It's easy to work with. A couple tin snips and self-tapping screws, some oversized washers. We can do a lot of magic with this expanded metal. If you want to get fancy, you can put some hinges on, on a couple sides of it so that it flips up and down and you can bolt it down on one side and then flip it, undo that bolt and put it up on the other. Uh, if you want to get some solid surfaces, you can use just some basic sheet metal. But overall, you can see on the far right picture on the bottom, we've created a, there's a cage on that box, which just is somewhat easy to build if you have a machine shop in your, in your place that you can build. But just know this is a common problem with these belts. Seven feet to the ground, you do have to guard them. And, and a lot of times people have the perception that it's going to be expensive. Uh, you can go out and buy guards from... Uh, companies that fabricate these for them. But as you can see here from what Michael's just shown you, that you can do this, a lot of this stuff for yourself on the cheap. And as we go through this presentation, I don't want you to get pigeon-toned into looking at a machine and going, huh, I don't have that machine. I guess I don't need to worry about that slide. You need to know that the code was written in a vague, expansive way that you need to see these machines for what they are a possibility that you might have something that relates to this in some way. So when we're training our inspectors, we teach them a basic principle, and then we go over it thousands of times with them in different areas to show them how they can be put together. Let, let, let's go to the next one if that's okay, Rick. Okay, now we're talking about projecting shaft ends. 
Projecting shaft ends, again, within seven feet of the floor or working level, shall present a smooth rounded edge and a smooth end and shall project or shall not project a distance greater than one half the diameter of the shaft beyond the end of the bearing unless guarded by a non-rotating case. And let me say that you need to really read this. Rick just read it to you. You just need to read it over again as I'm talking here so that you understand somewhat of the insanity of this law to a certain degree. Uh, there is merit behind it. I want you to know there is merit behind it, but when you first hear it, it does sound a little quirky, all right? Remember, if it's seven feet or closer to the ground, seven feet or closer to the ground, if you have a shaft that sticks out half of the diameter of the shaft. So if you have a two inch shaft round, the roundness, the diameter of the shaft is two inches and it sticks out more than one inch, you must guard it. You've got to guard it with something that can go over the end. The bottom left picture you can see is a shaft with some uh, grids in it, uh, some, some grooves in it. you got to guard that one altogether. I don't care how long it sticks because you can see in the first part of the code, it says that it has to be smooth. So as you're looking at your long press, you have a printing press, you have a number of different things and you have these shafts sticking out, you can guard these in one of two ways. Number one, you can guard them by putting a fixed cone of some kind that does not spin over them, or you can just cut the shaft off, all right? I prefer cutting off the shaft if you can do it. That way we don't have to worry about guards coming off, guards coming on. On the longevity of things, Rick, it really just comes into a place where you just shear it off, make sure it's smooth, and it works. Right. It's a, it's a lot simpler if you can do it, but, but in the times when you can't, you want to use something like we have the example in the lower right there that's just going to cover the whole thing, and the key is, is that it's going to be connected to a part of it where it's not going to be rotating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you have questions as we go through this, we're going to get into a longer table saw one here. If you do have questions, then uh, I'd ask you just to keep them coming. We appreciate the comments regarding how to get rid of the double sound and whatnot. Uh, that's great. Just keep on doing that. We really appreciate and your patience with our uh, technical difficulties in here. Okay. So now as we get onto this uh, table saw, this one's a little bit lengthy and it's actually two part, but we'll start here. It says each hand fed table saw shall be guarded by a hood which completely encloses that portion of the saw blade above the table and that portion of the blade above the material being cut. Part one, the hood shall automatically adjust itself to the thickness of the, the thickness of and remain in contact with the material being cut at the point where the stock encounters the saw blade or the hood may be fixed or manually adjusted hood or guard provided the space between the bottom of the guard and the material being cut does not exceed a quarter of an inch. Then there's the exception, except when cross-cutting, grooving, datoing, or datoing and rabbiting or a spreader shall be provided and fastened securely to the saw. It shall be designed and installed in accordance with the provisions of section 4296. Before I get on to the second part of this code, Michael, do you have any comments on this area? Well, I do. I, I, the pronunciation of dadoing and didoing, I have heard it pronounced both ways, but Rick, you probably did it the best out of ever I've heard. When you see this exception, a lot of times you guys are gonna go like this. Oh man, this is awesome. That's the exception I need to take off that, that saw. But just understand that, that this exception, you better be, be darn careful about it. You better make sure that your cross cut is done and you take it off and put it back on again right after that. And if you do take off that saw blade and somebody gets injured while the guard is off and they were cross cutting and still got injured, understand that will not stop the, a citation from coming. Yes, it might not be under 4300.1 or 2, but it will be under creating an unsafe area, work environment, or not doing enough training. They, they will find some way to pop you if you get hurt pulling off this guard. Now, I've seen fines from anywhere from uh, two or three grand to $18,000 on this no table saw guarded issue, and, and it can be, it could be deadly. Rick? Okay. So as we continue on in this code here, 
uh, says ripping operations shall comply with the following requirements in addition to those in subsections A and B. One, the hood or other guard shall be so designed as to prevent a kickback or separate attachment that will prevent kickback shall be provided. Anti-kickback devices shall be designed to be effective for all thicknesses of material. Push sticks or pull blocks shall be provided at the workplace in several sizes and types suitable for the work to be done. So this entire ridiculous code here basically gets down to this. Put your hood guards back on. Make sure that anti-kickback device is there and the splitter is on the back side of it. As you look at the bottom right picture, you can see it's got the anti-kickback, it's got the hood guard, and it's got a splitter on the back side so these things don't, this piece of wood doesn't bind on the other side and cause you a problem. Right now in the beginning of this webinar, we're talking about these individual issues when it comes to blades and whatnot. But not all machines have a code specifically like the table saw does. Table saws just create so many accidents, they decided to make a code about it so they could put it to bed. But a lot of these codes are general and vague, and we're going to get into that in a few minutes. But just know that these laws are universal to a certain extent. If you've purchased a table saw without one of these devices on it, there is no grandfather clause. There is nothing that says that it, that, that it just, you know, it's okay. You might even suggest to the Cal Ocean Inspector when it's out there, it's not in use. It's not mine. It's, it, it's, it's the boss's personal table saw that he keeps out back. None of that matters. If it's not in use, it better be unplugged, locked and tagged out with something over the outlet and put not in use, out of order in some fashion. Because if Cal Ocean doesn't see those things, then they're going to assume it's in use and you're going to have a hard time in front of a judge. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about some of the different types and methods of guarding. Uh, the first one here is a fixed guard. Michael, Boy, tell us a little bit about how the fixed guards work. Well, fixed guards are usually the most common things you've got. Obviously, Rick has found a picture where everything and their mother is, is guarded in there. Well, that is a lot of garden going on. Uh, and everything in there seems to be done, so that's a good one. Now, these fixed guards, like I said, can be made out of expanded metal, sheet metal, a combination of the two. Your guys are pretty darn creative out there. They got, you got machine shop guys out there that can make things work that shouldn't be working anymore. And so I'm always impressed by that. But one of the things these guys really hate to work with is the guards. A lot of these guys hate taking them off and hate putting them back on again because the machine needs a lot of maintenance or they have a lot of things going on there. Try to build your fixed guards with the end in mind in this perspective. Does the guard need to come totally off? Maybe I can fix it in one area and put some hinges on it so it flips down. But when it flips down, it needs to be done in a way that can be secured so it doesn't invertly get knocked open or accidentally knocked open. If you're going to have something like that, then it's got to be able to be bolted down or screwed down so that it doesn't open. Your next question might be, well, what's the point of having hinges on it then? Well, you put hinges on a guard and fix one side, it's a lot less likely to get taken off and never put back on again. Why? Because when maintenance is done, it's strapped to the machine. Now they just flip it over and put in the two screws to hold that other side down. So fixed guarding is my first choice when it comes to machines. But as you know, and we're going to get into with Rick, that always isn't possible, is it, Rick? That's right. And, and, and one of the key elements is here with the fixed guards is obviously they're going to be placed at a certain distance so that you're going to be kept away from the hazard. Um, and, and, you know, as you see in these here, you've got some pretty tight mesh so that somebody can't get their hand in there. I, I think at times uh, that, that Cal OSHA's philosophy on these is a matter of if, if they can, they will. If you can get your finger in a hole, you shouldn't be doing it. Okay, the next one is an interlocking guard. Now, me and Rick had a debate over these pictures. We showed a lot of different pictures that we went through. We tried to figure out something that we can show you, and, and this is the one that I felt like was the best. You don't, real, don't, don't worry about the cage, but the interlocking guards are something that really is a cool feature to have on a machine. It makes it so the machine is almost dummy-proof when it comes to the, the user. If the door is open, it won't work. The interlocking guard makes the machine so it does not work. My biggest problem with interlocking guards 
is that you guys will put them on your machines to give the appearance of safety. But then they bypass the interlocking guard by doing some cockamamie thing in it to make it so it doesn't activate so it can be used with the door open. This is very bad. If you've got an interlocking guard that is out of order, doesn't work, or has been Mickey Mouse to be bypassed, after this webinar, you should go out there and deal with it. And if you have employees that keep doing it, you need to deal with them aggressively, okay? Aggressively, write them up, terminate them. This is a problem for you because what it says is you knew you needed to have a guard, but you just didn't care enough to make sure it was in, in place. And that, that is a problem with these interlocking guards. And, and obviously, needless to say, if, if the guards disconnected if the switch is disconnected it's the same as not being guarded at all oh yeah okay so the next one is an automatic guard automatic guards are things that can come out we you know so you also can be heard that they're lasers or lights or these guards will just come into place when the machine is working in this kind of a description we're going to talk about laser guards these automatic or lazy guards that are in place for as you can see here a uh, a, a press break these are very important to you. A lot of times you have a bending, a steel bending machine that they're making uh, uh, drywall studs, not drywall, yes, dry, aluminum drywall studs for commercial enterprise or whatnot. And as they're making these, they got these long machine with a bazillion rollers on it, and you can't guard all the rollers. This is where laser guards really come into play. You can find a good uh, person who does laser guards if you go to eeap.com and go to links page on our main website. We've got a series of different uh, people that we recommend or will give you started on down the road of some laser guarding that you can take a look at. But all together, these automatic guards, which are laser guards, I don't have the picture on it, but these could be safety mats that if you stand on it deactivates the machine in some fashion. All of these are going to be an automatic guard so that if anything hits, boom, everything just comes into play. I love these. You really need to consider these with your tough machines like your press brakes and whatnot with that. Okay. The next one is guarding by location. Now, obviously, we talked a little bit about the guarding by location with the things that are yep. more than seven feet above the ground. But there's other times when something might be on the ground that you're going to want to guard by location. And, Michael, give us a little bit on this here. Well, guarding by location is, is my second favorite thing besides guarding with a fixed guard because guarding by location can be very inexpensive. Let's say you have a massive machine that is built in 1920s, which I know some of you guys got, and it's just the guarding for it would just be insane. You, you would almost spend enough time in payroll and, and manpower, I mean manpower and, 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 and labor, not labor, in uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Materials. Thank you, Rick. Materials to be able to buy another machine to a certain degree. This picture shows just putting up a nice fence and isolating a machine works. Now, a lot of my clients will say, well, I'm going to guard by location, Mike. I'm going to take your advice up. I'm going to put up some caution tape. I'm going to put up a little nylon band that kind of goes up like I'm at a grocery store at a bank teller line or something. These are really not guarding by location because when you put up a guard by location, you have to stop the employee, not detour, because a, a caution tape is deterrence. You have to stop an employee from going in there, and then I would request on that kind of a guarding by location, an interlocking guard, if possible, at the gate door to go in. If it's not, then we just want to put a lock on it and, let, and have, make somebody with a key go in. Okay. Our next one here, and Michael talked about uh, using tape. You can see we've got a little warning sticker up here at the top. And again, that, that's not actually guarding, but reminders are definitely helpful and, and to help keep your employees safe. But our next one here is guarding by restraint. Uh, Michael, we got some pretty weird looking uh, equipment here yeah, going on with these with these ropes tied to their hands. Well, if you're looking to piss off your employees, this is a good way to do it. Just show them this picture, they'll start to get irritated. I know you guys out there that are masters with a brake press, you see this picture and you start laughing, you think not a chance in the world would I ever be using that thing. And I'm telling you that this might be a, a, a good option. And this is when it comes into play. Specifically for the brake press. You're sitting there in an issue, they're telling you must guard the brake press, guard the brake press. And lasers don't work because of the size of the machines. This is when the restraints are going to come into play. 
Now, you might go 20 or 30 years without having a Cal OSHA visit, but I promise you when one of these offices get a hold of you and on your press bricks, and this brake press that you've got isn't guarded properly, and they tell you to guard it, and lasers and everything else is just too weird because of the fact of the size of the machine and how your, your material is going into it, these restraints comboed with some extension hand tools to hold the material might be an option at its last resort to make it happy. You can see the guy's got a punch press on the left side with those restraints. I've seen that a lot, especially when you've got a line of punch presses going on. But restraints are still used today. It's not a bad feature, but I always say, my gosh, it's enough to make an employee crazy to a certain, goal, a certain case when it pulls them back. Okay. Next, we want to talk about the manufacturer specs versus Cal OSHA specs. Michael already uh, mentioned about grandfathering in on old equipment that you may have that didn't come with guards and that Cal OSHA doesn't care about that. But how, how does it come when with things that you may have purchased, uh, you know, here in California even, or it has manufacturer's guards on it, and, and how Cal OSHA looks at that? Well, you know, Germany makes some darn fine machines, and a lot of these machines that I see nowadays without good guarding on it comes from either Germany or, or Italy. And when these guys are, you guys are talking about these beautiful machines, about this, just know that Cal OSHA does not require sellers of machines in the state of California to have their machines up to compliance before they can sell them here. Let me make sure you're clear. If you sell a machine in California, you don't have to make sure it's compliance when you sell it. The user has to make sure it's compliance when they use it. And so it doesn't matter where you bought the machine. It doesn't matter how old the machine is. You can see that these punch presses in the picture to your left, these might be some older machines. But that flywheel and that spinning wheel with the belt pulley and the shaft protruding on the right or left side must be guarded if it's within seven feet to the ground. Now, this picture is a little difficult to tell if it is or not, but a measuring stick, when you, if you had one of these in your shop, would be just fine. But just know that the people who make this stuff don't have to be making it to Cal OSHA specs because every state in the union here might have different regulations on how they want that guarded. Okay, let's take a look at some of the common violations that uh, not only that we see out in the field, but uh, that we see citations coming across for all the time. Rick, we didn't get these. Avoid them. We didn't get these from our clients, did we, Rick? No, we did not. Good. I want to make sure that's clear to everybody. These did not come from our client base. Luckily, we took these off the internet when we just did random Google searches. Our reports are all confidential all the time. Okay, so this first one here, as you can see, we've got an air compressor here, and uh, you've got, again, just yep. like you had in the drill press, where you've got pulleys and belts that are exposed where somebody could potentially uh, get their hand in there. Yep, you got to guard these, and remember on your, on your air compressors, on a side note, you must have a sign that says starts and stops automatically, and make sure your air compressors have a permit from Cal OSHA on there, and if you don't have the permit, don't worry about that. Uh, just call our office. We can tell you where to get it or call the local Cal OSHA office and they send out a person. But uh, the stickers that say start and stop automatically, I think I have them online for a few bucks for, to my clientele. And, and one of the things that, that we see commonly is that uh, th there'll be guards on these uh, compressors, but from the front it's guarded like you see in the picture on the right. But if you go to the back side, uh, like if you look on the picture on the left, you can see the bottom part of it is guarded, but but at the top is not. So if, if this particular one here, maybe the cage goes over that and covers it, but Cal OSHA is going to look at that. If you can stick your hand in from behind, the, it's a potential for a hazard. So yeah. you've got to cage it all the way around. Yeah, yeah, all the way around and make sure that expanded metal is tight enough where I can't get my itty bitty girl fingers in there. Okay, sewing machines. Cal OSHA loves getting these uh, these manufacturers of clothing with these sewing machines, Michael. They do, they do. Uh, these sewing machines make people crazy. Uh, this machine that you're looking at is not guarded appropriately. And remember the, what we saw, pinch points. And we in the first code that we read when we first started this webinar, that applies to sewing machines. There is no exceptions for sewing machines. So you need to have a guard that does not guard the flywheel because we all know you got to move that when you sew. But the where the belt comes to the flywheel and goes around on top of the table, it must be guarded. 
and they do sell guards online that you can buy that fit or you can make them. I, I, I really don't care. But the more common unguarded problem with sewing machines is underneath the table. And I had a lot of hard, I had a hard time trying to find a good picture of that that wasn't one of my clients. And so we didn't put it in. But I will tell you that it's the underside of the table where the belt comes around the bottom wheel and comes around. That area must be guarded. You have these people that are sitting at these tables all day long. They get very comfortable. And believe it or not, since we're most of us in this world are right-handed, is that correct, Rick? Yes. These women or men, you don't want to sound sexist by who sews, these people will put their bags, lunch boxes, or purses on the right side underneath that wheel underneath. And we're having people reach down there, get their clothes caught, hands in it, and you need to make sure your wheels underneath the tables are guarded. Yeah, again, that, that expanded metal just works beautifully for this job. Yes. Okay, this next one here. Um, I love this one here with, with the saw, with the guard that has been tied back there with a with a shoelace or something, it appears, and uh, I I know that the, that just that alone is I've seen citations on that particular violation where someone had two two saws like that on the job site got nailed both for both of them twenty five hundred dollars a piece that was a five thousand dollar violation for a couple of guys tying back their saw. Why would you want to tie back your saw blade? I'm sure there's lots of reasons where our wonderful people out there that use the skill saw a lot do. But you just got to know, you, you, you cannot tie that back. If that thing gets a kickback on it and that guard does not come down, it can come back into the groin, the leg, the arm, just like we saw in the first picture. You, you could, And this guy is not going to have a hard time going through meat. This thing was meant to go through some pretty some serious material, and no matter what blade you've got on it, a composite blade, a metal blade, wood cutting, you know, whatever you got on it, just know that when that thing pops back, it's going to have no mercy for you. And like Rick said, the fines are astronomical. If you look on the right there, we've got a little cutting wheel, a cutoff tool that does not have a guard on it. Very common thing to find out there in the field. And in addition to pinch points, uh, you know, you're guarding against uh, flying chips, sparks, or shards from that wheel. When that thing explodes on you, uh, it's going to be important that that thing is guarded. Make sure the wheel that you put on that bad guy, Rick, you got to make sure that it is gear geared for that size and the rotations of, of that. The, sometimes people will put a, a too big of a wheel on these things, and what will happen is they'll explode or something bad's going to happen. But you need that guard on there, and you can also see by by just the same conversation about guarding, the cabling to the constension cord or its cord coming down. The guarding is the outer sheath, and the same principles apply. You might not get popped for a guarding, but you'd get exposed for exposed wiring on that guy. But remember, guarding all together. Make sure the danger has its protection in place. Okay. Next, we've got the bench grinders. Oh, I love the bench grinders. I love the bench grinders. Yeah. It's uh, every, Practically everybody's got one of these in their shop. And uh, why don't you talk about the particulars here, Michael, that they, that they got to be making sure that they've got in place and, and in comparison with these pictures that we've got here. I, I've seen bench grinder cases that have a total of fifteen dollars to $16,000 for just one bench grinder. These things got to be worth only 80 bucks to 150 bucks to buy a brand stinking new one. You can see on the one on the far left, we've got issues on this guy. Uh, the tool rest is completely gone, if not extinguished, on the right side, excuse me, on the left side grinding wheel of the left picture. The upper guard rest is gone. It, it really is just thrashed altogether. If you have a machine shop and you do business with us, I promise you we've taken pictures of your, of your grinders before, so you need to take a look at that and ask for it. But you need three components. You need the tool rest in place. You need the upper guard in place that covers the top of the wheel that is very difficult to see in these pictures. But there is one, and Sam or your inspector, when they're out there, can show you. And then you need that, that, that cover that comes over the top for the sparks. Those are the components that you need. If you don't have that cover, then you better have some sort of face shield on or something to protect. But nonetheless, when you use this machine, please wear your safety glasses at the very least. Please, please. Now, that bottom... That bottom uh 
piece is adjustable. And, it is. And so what are the specs on that, Mike, that they need to keep that? The bottom one needs to be put in within a fourth, and the top guard needs to be put within an eighth of an inch. The fourth and an eighth. And those are in your inspection reports that we put in. So if you have a guarding in place, you can just read your old inspection reports. If you don't know where they are, they're on your mobile. You're on your client center on the computer. You can just log in, and it'll show you all of the past detailed inspection reports we've done for you. But you need to figure out who's in charge of these work areas, and you need to discipline them when, they're, when their grinders are not in place. This is low-hanging fruit that is easy to cite, and each attribute, bottom guard not being in the compliance, top guard not being in compliance, and even, heaven's sake, the thing not being mounted to the table that it's on could be a, a point of the violation, could be a, a separate penalty for you. Yes, we'll see a lot of times people love to take an old rim yes. and weld the pole to it and use that as a stand and then they're then then they will say michael that they they don't want to bolt it down because we move it around from area to area yep. within the shop and that's true that's true but when you're using it rick you got to make sure and the code says it shouldn't walk or move or wobble walk this can't it can't vibrate away that's why the rims that you're talking about rick are very difficult to prove in the hearing that it doesn't walk in fact many times the judges have ruled that if you just mount it to a rim it's not good enough if you're going to move it try to get something big wide and heavy it won't gonna, walk or vibrate or right move. you want to put something heavy on it and then when he was talking there about having it but within the uh an eighth and a quarter of an inch. He's talking about to the wheel there. So uh, as you use the, the grinder, of course, Thanks. over time, the wheel will get smaller. And so those plates are adjustable and, and you need to adjust it periodically to make sure that you're within the, the standards there. Yep. Okay. All right. So uh, for the few people that we've invited out that are not clients of ours, if you do want to have any of this, take a look at your machine guarding or whatnot, let us know. If you are clients of ours and you have questions about one of your machines that need to be guarded, do not hesitate to give us a call and ask us some special questions or, hey, I just need you to come out and tell me about guarding of this machine. So it might be a little outside your normal inspection, but we want to make you happy and come out and do that for you. Just call us and give us a call, and we'll try to send out our general manager, Sam Crawley, that can come out and take care of you. Okay. So let's get into uh, some questions here. We've already had a few people send in some questions. Uh, and our first one here says, is there something I can reference for the sewing machine guards? Well, the sewing machine guards are very difficult uh, for me to find and put into my LinkedIn area. But what I can do is this. That is a good question. Uh, let me ask my team today, if you don't mind taking that note, Rick. What we'll do is we'll ask my team today to figure out uh, a spot or somebody who puts together the sewing machine guards. And we'll see if we can put that into our, our links page on our main website. Uh, give me a day or so, and I should be able to have that put in on the links page of our website so we can give you that reference to that. Okay, next question. It says, I've got my maintenance guys using a saw stop saw. Do I have to get after them about the guard still? I love this question. You know what? God bless America and the man who made the stop saw. If you don't know what a stop saw is, Rick, are you familiar with the stop saw? No, I'm not. A stop saw is the most beautiful table saw in the world. It might just be the most expensive, but nonetheless, the stop saw is wonderful. And basically how it works is this. It's a table saw, and people usually always take the guards off of it. But what's cool is that the blade itself has a small electrical charge in it. So thus, if your skin or your body or a conductive piece of material touches that blade, it pulls the electricity out of the cutting blade, which sends off a sensor that stops the blade in its tracks. It does not slow it down but it has a breaking mechanism that locks onto the blade to stop it. Now, I have never tried this myself. If you want to see the video, I'm sure you could YouTube uh, stop saw. I am not, never put my finger to it, but they do a hot dog test to uh, put a hot dog to it to see if it'll I cut it I have seen that actually. Yeah, yeah, you have. So, so what I'm saying to you is this. There is no Cal OSHA law or exemption for your stop saw. Your, your statement now is, but does the electrical static charge or the way it stops act as a guard? I've had no judge tell me yes. Some of the inspectors say yes. Some of the inspectors say no. So what I'm saying to you is this one's hard to tell until I see it go all the way to hearing. A lot of times I see the inspectors say, no, that's a guard on it. It's fine. But what's funny is this. If I ask the owner who bought this thing to test it with his own finger, 
They always tell me not a chance. And so with that being said, if you don't want to test it yourself and you own the company, you might want to put your guards up. I've seen the video, but I've never seen one of the owners say, yeah, I'll test it. Turn it on. I'll put my finger on it right now. And until the owner's willing to test it, I say you put a guard on it. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like we got any other questions at this point. Um, just, you know, want to make sure that we're clear as to the, the importance of making sure that your machines are properly guarded. These site, the machine guarding is one of the most commonly cited uh, issues by Cal OSHA. The, the citations are very expensive and I'm sure Michael uh, will attest to they can be difficult to defend uh, because usually there's probably not a lot of solid ground to stand on as to why it wasn't guarded. It's not a right or wrong issue. It, well, it's not an innocent or guilty. If they've got the picture of the unguarded machine, it's a matter of you're guilty, but now how much are you going to pay? And there's a lot of reasons for machines not being guarded. You didn't do it in the first place. Your employees took it off. A lot of different things. If it is an issue with your employees, just know you have got to make sure that uh, you guys are taking control of things and disciplining the employees when they need to so that you guys can keep things in place and, and keep things moving. Uh, we appreciate your business. If you do have any recommendations on what you'd like us to do a webinar next, we would be glad to do it. I do see another question has come through on that end of it, but we just wanted to tell you how appreciative we are of what you guys of, of what you guys do for us. Rick, what's the next question? Okay, it says, are guards also required for bench buffer machines? Buffer machines at times are confused with grinding machines. They certainly are. Let me just tell you that. They certainly are. And so this is what you have to guard on a buffing machine. If you've got a grinder machine that has been turned into a buffing machine, or it's just a buffing machine, these are the things that need to be guarded on it. First, you have a buffing wheel itself. The answer to your question specifically is no, you don't have to guard the buffing wheel. But... The shaft that comes out from the motor to the wheel needs to be guarded. See, that's a rotating shaft. And so like in the beginning of this webinar, if the shaft is exposed more than half of the diameter of the shaft, then you would need to guard the shaft. A lot of times I see people with a 6 to 12 inch shaft or 6 to 8 inch shaft on it so they can get the material all around the buffing arm. And if that's the case, you would need to build a fixed cone that goes out along the shaft. First point, guard the shaft. Second point is going to be the nut on the other side. you got to put a nut cap on the other side of it. And so remember the code, the shaft has to be smooth and less than half the diameter. It's not the problem with the less, less of the half the diameter, but it is a problem with the, the, the threads on it. So you got to get me a nut cap on the other side, and then you'll be good to go. Okay, another question. We use a fixed belt sander-styled grinding bench. Pretty hard to guard. Any suggestions? My first suggestion is you have Sam come out and he'll tell you exactly one on one as he sees the machinery and the and the and the and the material you're trying to sand on it. That will be key to giving a direct opinion. But just a guideline, you got to guard the pinch points. If it's a belt sander and you and, and it's and a, it's on a table, what was the what was the, how was it said, Rick? Well, it's a fixed belt. Yep. Sander style grinding bench. Gotcha. So you're, you're going to want to find this. You want to make sure it's the pinch points. It's as the belt comes around the corners that you're looking to guard. A lot of times as I've seen these, you can do it. It's not easy. It makes it difficult to sand and you always have a problem with it. That might mean you need a bigger one. It might mean that you need a different size one. Uh, but, but what I'm saying is this, without seeing a picture of it or the material you're doing, what I'd like to do is please, uh, I, all I have is your name there. If you want to email uh, Rick Roman, so you'll email Rick, R-I-C-K, at eeap.net. Uh, tell us who you are. We will send somebody out there to give you our opinion face-to-face. Okay. Well, on that note, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up and uh, look forward to seeing you guys again next month. And any final words here, Michael, before we sign off the air here? We've got a mobile training uh, app coming out. Uh, this is going to be a great thing for our clientele. Uh, once we get this in place, you'll be able to do tailgate lessons and individual training on the go off your tablet or mobile phone. 
And when you sign, you'll be able to sign on the mobile phone your signature and type in the employee's name, and that will go right into your EEAP client center logged in. And so that will be a great way for you to do these tailgate lessons on job sites without holding the whole tons of paperwork, whatnot with that. So that should be coming out towards the first of the year. And uh, we are calling select companies to be test subjects for us on that. And we're grateful for those who have been able to be a part of that. And we should roll it out to everybody by the first of the year. All right, folks. Thanks again for spending some time with us here today. Hope this is all helpful for you. And uh, look forward to seeing you guys next month. Thank you.